the sky has blood in it, blue and red make purple. I'm dealing with a musical genius, a prodigy. I mean, this dude, you know, what is he? He was from outer space. He was an oddity. He had the ability to put something different in every bar. I mean, he wasn't from here, man, I'm telling you. He was really an amazing spirit guide. Hang around him and stuff was going to happen, and it did. I loved my friends and my family, and but I was totally ready to go wherever he wanted to go and for as long as that would take. The public hears what he wants them to hear. I would just be fascinated with these pieces of work that he was doing. I just couldn't believe the meticulous singing and finding these notes and creating these operas. He would have so many ideas going and he dreamed of song. It was just always going through him, especially at that time. He was so prolific at that time. The 80s were in full bloom on that album. The album is about escapism. The 1999 album, all of the things that were attempted, the, the records that preceded, came together in this sort of perfect storm. It's my body of work. I'm trying to put in that body of work things that I haven't done. After the Stones gig happened, it just solidified in him. Are you serious about this kid? It was kind of like God saying, are you sure? Here, I'll show you what it looks like. I mean, I ain't never seen no craziness like that. That was bad. I was like, man, what do we do next? This is crazy. He says, no. He says, this ain't our crowd. He said, you're going to see our crowd when we get to Philly. With some Prince fans. They were straight up Prince fans. You know, they loved everything that he was doing, and everything that he was about. You know, the whole androgyny, everything, man. He just loved it. 1999, he really figured it out, who his audience was. 1999 is where it started. I mean, yeah. 1999 was a pop record. Little yeah. Corvette was a pop record. Corvette for the rock people, 1999 for party people, you know. I'm going to take the Stones audience, and I'm going to take this Rick James audience, and I'm going to make one big my audience. Yeah, that whole year was really fast-paced. He knew he was on the precipice of something mm -hmm. really great with 1999 because Andre had just left and he was kind of on his own. And I think he was a little colder as a human being at that point. I think he gave himself permission to be as incredibly selfish as he wanted to be. Mm -hmm. I think there were parts of that journey that he knew only he could do. It didn't require the whole band being in the studio recording like other bands did. This was really his own. At the end of the time tour, he came to L.A., that is where I came in because I was like a neutral body. I didn't really know all of these dynamics with people. So I think that it was easier for him to really just be free and mm -hmm. creative. And we got a lot of work done. That's when we started working on 1999. I'd get the call that he was in town. And then I knew my life was his for the next few months. It was grueling hours. I have never worked so long or so hard for anybody in my life because he never stopped. He was demanding, there's no doubt about it. He demanded more of certain people than he demanded of others. If he respected you, you couldn't have a better friend, a better bandmate, a better boss. You couldn't have had one. Yeah, but he yeah. could be mean. And during that period, he was also writing songs for Vanity Six, and he was writing songs for The Time. So we were doing those albums. Morris would come in, and that's when we cut International Lover. I remember, you know, he said, did you hear that, Peggy? It was at a part where it said, your seat can be used for a flotation device. And I laughed. They always had a good time. He would uh, develop Morris's character together. You know, because that was Prince. I mean, you know, that was all Prince. I mean, it was Morris, too. But with the time, there was a lot of banter. And it was it was fun. It was like the guys were around, you know. And he and Morris were pretty good friends. Funny, because you never knew who was coming in or who was in town or what was going to happen. It, was, it wasn't like he came in and said, OK, we're going to work on the time stuff. Because it wasn't like he talked to you about it. That time, he also had broken up with Susan Muncy, but he was also working on Vanity Six. He knew that Brenda could sing because I guess she'd probably singing while she was working, working in the dressing room and stuff. And next thing we know, she's 
in Minneapolis with Susan and Vanity recording. And they were in and out of the studio. When I first met Vanity, she came roller skating around the park, coming towards us. And I mean, when I saw her coming, I was like, oh, oh, oh. When he was looking at me, he cracking up, he on the floor laughing. And I was like, what's so funny? I said, you see that girl? I said, look, she come. I said, oh, she's coming towards us. She comes towards us and jumps right on it. And he laying on the ground, cracking up, brown mark, me vanity. He deliberately did not tell me who she was because he wanted to see my reaction. Well, first of all, Brenda, Fanny and Susan. Brenda's from Boston, Fanny's from Canada, and I'm from Minneapolis. The group is based out of Minneapolis. Vanity, uh, what part does uh, sex appeal play in your success, in the success of the group, I mean? I would possibly say that it plays a lot of, uh, um, it plays a great deal part, you know, especially us in our lingerie. Uh, Brenda, why is it Vanity 6 and not Vanity 3? Well, it, it stems from a song that we wrote that's on the album. It's the only ballad that's on the album. It's called Three Times Two Equals Six. And there's a line in there that goes that um, we feel that women have twice as much tribulation than a man to have to take care of what they have to do in life. And it, it stems from there. Thank you for your secrets and lots of success. That's it, let the jokey joke inside joke, you know. I never knew the album that we were actually working on until we assembled it. Well, and he didn't expect it to be a double album. It just kept on happening. He was beginning to fight the, the editing of the majors, of mass marketing. It isn't it the, the bitter battle that everybody thinks it is. It was mainly an issue of whether or not I could record when I wanted to. He just decided not to edit those songs. He had more money from the label. He delivered what he needed to previously, so he was able to get these new drum machines and new equipment. He developed a system of sounds that no one else had. It was very profound. He did these horn licks on an Oberheim synthesizer, and these little endings that he had on his licks were very unique. I mean, you could tell a Prince lick from a mile away. It was da -da -da -da, little horn licks. They were synthesizer licks. This magic formula for being edgy, but at the same time being commercial and having huge radio hits. He took the synthesizer horns, the pearl concussion tom-toms on top of the LM1 drum machine. That was a new thing, drum machines and synthesizers. Well, just his use of the drum machines, he saw this machine that I made that not only had sampled sounds, but also you could program your own beat, that you could alter the sound of the drum. It sounded unusual, interesting, and different. Don Batts, um, brilliant, talented, technical wizard. You trigger the velocity through this early Model T version of what was yet to come. Um, Prince was pushing the envelope as far as technology. All of a sudden there was playable versions of those sounds, and for something completely different in the drumming world, well, first of all, he had one foot in the beat-oriented music world, but he had the other foot in the guitar world, the rock world. The drum machine would do exactly what he told it to do. A lot of people tried to copy that. A lot of the Minneapolis guys sounded like that. They were copying his style. He was the originator. They did form their own genre. He was so different the way he worked. You know, most people write songs and then they collaborate with a producer and they come into the studio and he didn't. It was all in his head. I'm, I'm concerned with why people see themselves as us against them. I used to think that we were the ones that came up with that. But see, we didn't start these wars. Uh, we certainly don't want to go to them. As I was coming into my own uh, persona and understanding of who I was, I never talked down to my audience. You have to challenge them. It's just not about a party. When we see brothers getting dragged in trucks down streets to their death, you know, we're looking at the future. And either we can get in here now and fix that and do the best we can to help God fix it, or we, you know, we can <laughs> punch the clock in. Anger is in songs like People and Water and It Ain't No Fun to Me and stuff like that. I do have that side of me, but what I try to do is I, to the best of my ability, funnel it back into the music. When it hit him, he just started writing it down on envelopes. Anything he could write his lyrics down. When it started coming, he wrote it down. 
it is an art the art and the craft of songwriting. He would go through these huge periods where he wouldn't sleep and he would just write, 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 and then he would go through a period where there was a lull. And that's what I read about geniuses. That's kind of what they do, is they have this huge peak where they are really prolific. Every single day he had a work ethic that was crazy. I mean, going into the studio for days and days, kind of a night owl. In the past, he had either tracked some of it out of town or mixed out of town. Ever since my third album, I was recording the albums myself in my own studio. He had an upgraded studio in the basement of his house. He just threw the tape up and, and played me the tracks. He had new ideas, which, which was always the case with him. The very first one might have been Lady Cab Driver. I mean, everybody is like imagining all sorts of things because we even had the bed springs rocking on that. We did the whole later cab uh -huh. driver doing direct harmony with him. And then it gets to this like breakdown. And then he wants all this moaning and groaning. We weren't in the studio. We were sitting in chairs. We were at the console recording this. And he goes, I know you can do it. And I mean, he, he knew I could at that point because yeah. we'd also been kind of fooling around a yeah. little bit. <laughs> I told him, you have to leave. I have to do it myself. He was mixing genres and styles. And I think that's one of the reasons he just felt at home at first have and attracted to it. One night when I was just spinning, kind of hunched over the turntables and felt a tap on my shoulder and turned around, it was Prince, and he's just holding an acetate of Irresistible Bitch. He says, will you play my record? You gotta remember where it came from, which was Dirty Mind. People in New York loved, you know, the musical talent or the risque look. And the critics loved it. He was appreciative, I think. In 1999, I had the opportunity to do the background vocals and, uh, and share the lead vocals. Uh, 1982, I wrote that. Uh, everyone that was around me, whom I thought to be very uh, optimistic people, were dreading those days. I, I just wanted to write something that gave hope. We were traveling. There was a hotel sign, free HBO. So everybody got to their room to turn on HBO. When you look at this man, this... Uh... Michel de Nostradamus. He was a respected French physician. That these predictions of the past, these warnings of the future, are not the opinions of the producers of this film. HBO documentary about Nostradamus. Michel de Nostradamus, whose predictions... And the prediction of the end of the world... ...have mystified scholars for over 400 years. But before continuing... Let me warn you now that the predictions of the future are not at all comforting. We were sitting around watching a special about 1999. In the year 1999 and seven months, from the sky will come the great king of terror. 1999, 1999. The world as it was at the end of the 20th century. There are a lot of people running around. A lot of people were talking about the year and speculating on what was going to happen. At some point in the early 21st century, we gave birth to AI. I knew that there were going to be rough times for the Earth. It was us that scorched the sky. The Prince, he had written 1999 the song. Fate is not without a sense of irony. It was very important for the band to execute the sounds that he had in his head. The song was going to be sung in a three-part harmony like... Uh, Sly and the Family Stone song. But he had already been playing like the keyboard line for a while with a drum machine, and then they just start coming in. Like I remember I got to rehearsal in the morning. He was actually at my keyboards and had the drum machine going, and he was like playing the boom, 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 boom. You know, he looked at me, come here. And he said, play that. And so he showed me the chords. The drum machine never stopped, you know, like it just kept going and going. And, and then so like as each person arrived at rehearsal that day and everyone would add in their part, you know, like Brown Mark arrived at rehearsal and, and, and he was like, here, just play boom, 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 you know. They'd almost think they were jamming the song. But there, there was a point during rehearsal, we were working on it. We all got together and we started singing and it wasn't really working. Well, I, I mean, at that point in time, the whole structure of it wasn't in place. And there were a bunch of vocals by different people, but it wasn't yet, okay, you sing this line from this verse, and then you sing that line, and then you go to this harmony on the chorus. It was none of that. It was just singing. That night, he had us come to his house 
Or he had me come. I don't remember who else was there except for Jill. I lived down the road. I was closest. Or he would call and ask me to, you know, come and sing on a part. I, I get this call to drive out to the house. Yes, Prince, you come over. I played my keyboard parts, and then we did the vocal. And at first I sang that verse line by myself, that first line, but we added Jill because Jill just has, <laughs> well, uh, I hate to say it, but she has a better voice than me. <laughs> well, she's a way better singer. She just had like that fiery, it just was better for like the opening line of a song because my voice was kind of, oh, I was dreaming when I was, I was just a little dreamier sounding. And she's more like, oh, I was dreaming when I was. <laughs> you know, she's like tough. There was just a tone quality. He and I were really good at blending. First he played me 1999. He put up the 1999 track. This time he had the record like substantially finished and had some holes that he wanted me to step into and fill. He played me a guide vocal that he had. It actually had me sing most of the song. And he had recorded it in such a way that it could have been alternating verses or it could have been what it ended up being on the record. And then after I kind of sang down the whole thing, it's like, well, do this harmony here. As I said, all right, you sing your harmony for the first part, then you sing your harmony for the second part, and I'll sing my harmony for the third. When everybody got their parts separated, then I knew we had something real special. When I heard it, I said, you did it. <laughs> That's it. When I was finishing up my vocals, he said, hey, I want you to do one more thing. That 1999, the pitched down, spoken 1999 and the vamp out, well, that's me. Because he had already done the don't worry, I won't hurt you. Let, let's kind of bookend that with this thing going out. So that, that was my voice. Corvette, he called me over on Lake Riley House. Studio was in the basement. He played me the track before we did anything, and it, was, it struck me right away as so messing around with this syndrome, concussions, to put the toms. It's like, wow, this is, that chorus is as powerful as, as you can get, you know, rock and roll. All the jockeys that were there before me. So I always would ask Prince questions, poking at him about stuff. So I said, what about Little Red Corvette? Didn't you write that about Maylene? He said, yeah. The first time we met, I was at the club, the Fox Trap. This was two weeks after the Capri Theater. He and Andre came in. He was just kind of looking at me and he was shy. Yeah, we had an immediate attraction. He just went out on the dance floor and started dancing with me. And back then he wasn't a very good dancer. He just was all over the place. Think about American Bandstand. That's what I was dealing with. I've never said that Prince and I were like one-on-one -on -one relationship. We were kicking it. It wasn't like I went home to meet mama and all that stuff. It wasn't like that. But we had an intense, passionate relationship while it lasted. I was always at the concerts. I was everywhere. I would get offers to come back and meet people backstage. We did our first show at the Capri. Mm -hmm. The record company didn't want us to tour after that because they thought somehow or another we weren't ready yet. So we took almost a year, yeah. you know, rehearsing. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dick Stockton, and I am reporting from the Met Center in Bloomington, Minnesota, where we present the scheduled 12-round bout between Mike Weaver and Scott Ledoux. Mike Weaver was in town for a fight with Scott Ledoux, Minneapolis's great white hope. We kind of had a chance to take a little moment and, uh, and kind of get in the mix, you know, get in the city and hang out, clubs. But I was at the University of Minnesota. There was an after party from some of the athletes from the U. Trent Tucker and all those guys were at the U. They wanted me to bring Mike over there because they knew I knew him because, you know, they're athletes. I wasn't a groupie or anything. Mike wins the fight. I took him to this house party and it's cold. It's really cold that night. And we're leaving. We're walking down the steps. As we're walking down, who opens the frickin' door? Prince and Andre Simone. I said, Prince, this is Mike Hercules Weaver and Andre, and they shook hands and that was it. And as we're walking down, we go outside. Mike said, who was that little dude? He looked at me like he wanted to kill me. Corvette, on the other hand, was just background vocal stuff. Hey, try this, try that. I had the opportunity to play the guitar solo. and He said, you know, I'm, I'm going to start playing guitar less and less. You're a better lead player anyway. I'm going to focus on being a front man, and I'm going to have you do most of the lead stuff from now on. Well, I just kind of did five passes. Just like so there are sort of four phrases in the song, but each of them came from a different path. So that by the time the record came out, I had to relearn the solo. The, the phrases don't fit together 
in terms of what you would normally do, how you would structure it. If we took a section of one pass for the first phrase, a section of another pass for the second, but then it switched to another take, and then this. he wanted to be a pop star he wanted a big pop record with a big fat pop open hook. secret <laughs> he never said it directly but it was obvious and we talked about radio all the time we, we talked about those things we talked about it in the band it was a discussion between prince and management and prince and the whole band of a song like 1999 but it's purely pop but at the same time it's apocalyptic so you know what i mean he found that sweet spot but it was risky yeah it was a new sound, but it had songs that were familiar, simple melodies that people would feel, now I've heard this before, it's infect them. And we were just excited. You know, he taught me so much. If the song is there, it doesn't really matter if it technically is perfect. It's the feel of the song. Well, I wanted to create something sexy. The first thing that I came up with he liked, but was deathly afraid of it because of women's rights. It was a stage set inspired by Clockwork Orange in the milk bar. So I wanted the whole stage set to be women holding up the risers and the guitar stands and all that stuff. And I wanted film projectors be up stage behind the band. Because I always, when I went to the movie theaters before moving lights, because people were smoking in the theaters, you'd see the beams moving. Oh, that would be really cool to see all that going on behind the band. But at the same time, I wanted to project an orgy onto the audience. Further down the line, Prince hired a couple of guys that designed and created clothing. That was the first kind of custom-made stage clothes. The purple belonged to him and he claimed it. Uh, he walks into rehearsal and you know, this shiny purple trench coat and he puts it on. We're going for like showbiz now. I always felt that Venetian blinds were kind of a kind of a sexual kind of visual mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. What we did was I automated the blinds so that they can move. Not the mm -hmm. ones in the, the actual risers yeah. but the ones behind yeah. and then I put mirror on it so it would kind of reflect the light. The, light. the guy in, in the kamikaze headband one day in soundcheck, our, our lighting director came in and he was wearing the kamikaze headband. Came back to him after soundcheck and I was going to hand it back to him. He said, no, no, no one should ever wear that but you. 1999 multiracial band, full-blown pancake makeup, white light. It wasn't the typical looking R&B band anymore. The lighter faces, I feel, my opinion, were definitely calculated marketing. Yes, but it wasn't that contrived. We weren't really thinking it like that. On tour, we had sound check every day. But we were rehearsing and writing, and Prince was experimenting and learning the band. Prince just wanted to jam most of the time. We spent many, many, many hours jamming in rehearsals and exchanging musical ideas. Everything was a jam, and he'll just jam on a thing for 20 minutes. Prince was smart enough to know, like, what he could pull out in each person. You're just all caught up in the song, and all of a sudden there's a three-minute hit. During that time, we shot at the Armory. It was just an intense three-day shoot to get as much as we could. It was like, let's pretend we're married, Corvette, 1999, and Automatic. Automatic was just kind of this big time to the bed thing. He knew that, you know, okay, I put a blonde girl, cater to the MTV generation. It kind of worked. So the first tour was 81 into 82. We were done in April of 82. We had between April and July before we started rehearsing for the 1999 tour. We rehearsed many, many hours. And, you know, he saw to that because we were under his production company. Everybody was very professional. It was obvious that he didn't tolerate the bullshit. So it was a very professional operation. Rehearsal so grinding and so long. I wouldn't want to be around me at that point in time. But when you got in front of 20, 30, 40, 80,000 people, you're glad you had it. Um, I hated it at first. It's like, come on, man, how many times can you play the same thing? But he told me this philosophy once. The more you learn it, the more it becomes who you are. When you hit stage, the dancing, the choreography, the, the energy, all of that. See, that's where our concentration is. It isn't on the musicianship. We already got that because the stuff was ingrained, embedded in our head. And then during sound checks, he could switch, shift, you know, he could add stuff. What time is it?
There was certainly an understanding that he was very heavily involved. Yeah, there was a guy named Mojo, a, a DJ, who started playing our first single, Get It Up. He played it for about a week and wouldn't tell anybody who it was. People thought it was Prince, but then they weren't quite sure. Uh, there was a listening session at one of the studios in town. It was for Warner Brother execs. We went to this place to hear the time. And this guy with the, the hood swishes in past us and goes down to the soundboard. You know, people are saying, is that Prince? Is that Prince? And I'm like, of course it's Prince. Hello. <laughs> it was a poorly kept secret. Of course, he was at the control soundboard with the little cane and the mustache and the hat on, the little round spectacle glasses. No one knew who he was. And Vanity Six was on the show Dude. as well. We had the time. He was coming out with, with Vanity, but the time was a really tight, legitimate band. It was great for us because it was like a one-two punch. And and at Black Radio, Prince had the creds at this point. So you go in with the time, you, you just automatically got two or three ads at the radio station. So you know, from a record company standpoint, it's good. Yeah, this is great. It's our latest single on the Warner Brothers label entitled Get It Up, and they are The Time. This is quite an interesting looking group, is it not? Well, I describe the time as being cool. You know, I worked a lot with Morris and Jerome and then Jimmy and Terry before they left. You know, there was an awful lot of promotion with them. They were very open to doing things. That's Terry Lewis. One step over. Jimmy Jam. Drums, please. Jelly Bean Johnson. <laughs> Go all the way in the back. JB, Jerome. With the fedora, with the little red feather. That's Monty Moyo on keyboards. There is a vision of loveliness. That's Jesse. That's Jesse Johnson. Jesse, nice to have you with us. Suddenly, as he came into town, he would leave. The guys at Warner Brothers heard it and just went, these are all great songs. So they went for it. That was just a funky damn album. People couldn't wait to get into it as far as, okay, let's promote this sucker. Because this, this is what we've been looking for. We actually had some time to work on this album because everyone knows how prolific he was with his albums. So it gave us as a record company more time. We were finished with 1999. And then he would go back to Minneapolis and then he would go back on the road. <laughs> Monday night, February the 28th, 8 p.m. at Pittsburgh Civic Arena is the 1999 tour starring Prince. Yes, Prince, live and uncensored. Along with special guests, The Time. What time is it? You gonna try and give me something I can shake my butt to? And introducing Vanity Six. Means of transportation optional. Be there. And then, you know, he goes up to the mic. I was like, oh, oh man, <laughs> no. The whole audience went into a frenzy. And that 1999 album blew up, so I'll never forget that tour. My music has connected because I've had the chance to fully realize my vision. I mean, it's just it's just a really fun-loving circus out there. And all of a sudden, we came in with controversy. Dun, 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 dun. Man, the whole audience went nuts. And this dude was so cool. He just handled it. He controlled it. All them people, he controlled everything. And when I saw that, I was like, man, I'm in a whole nother league. This is beyond me. And just the way that he understood how to control people with that music. And that's how he knew exactly what to do to get them where he needed them to be. And that curtain opened up and I saw him. And I remember I was just looking at him, all them people were screaming and hollering, and his little foot was tapping. And he had this funky little rhythm, just cool. I ain't never seen nobody that cool. You know, and he's, he got that little pimp walk, he was walking back and forth on the stage. He, he wanted me to know who he really was. So he sent for me, it was a Christmas present on the 1999 tour in Houston, and I was completely blown. The energy in those crowds were amazing. During the past two years, he's gained national acclaim with his top-selling albums and his unique brand of showmanship. And to sing that solid gold release tonight, here's Prince. 
because it was radio friendly initially it was heavily embraced at block radio pop radio had been trying to break him it's not easy especially back in that time because people unable to categorize him they were actually able to re-release 1999 and go back at radio and by then because it had started to sort of be a phenomena pop radio then started really looking at it then playing the album not only did the song go on to become a major smash but it also helped to establish this performer as one of pop and r&b's most creative stars He's with us tonight to sing his monster hit, Little Red Corvette. Here's Prince. Debuting at number 10 with his first top 10 hit on the pop chart is a man from Minneapolis who recently made the cover of Rolling Stone magazine, Prince and Little Red Corvette. From Hollywood, it's America's number one pop music show, America's Top 10 with Casey Kasem. This week, Prince. Our album Spotlight Song of the Week. It's a big hit for a star who learned how to engineer and produce his records while working as a security man in a Minneapolis recording studio. Back in 1976, when he was only 16 years old, Prince became friendly with a man named Chris Moon, who owns Moon Studios. Now, after Moon got to know Prince, he offered him a deal. In exchange for Prince keeping an eye on the studio over the weekend, Moon would show him how to engineer and produce his own records and let him use the equipment, too. Well, Moon wrote down the directions on a sheet of paper telling Prince which buttons did what. Moon says he'd spend the whole weekend there sleeping on the studio floor. Pretty soon, he got so good at it, I could sit back and do the listening. Well, since then, Prince has produced all five of his own albums. In our album spotlight, here he is with the latest hit from his album, 1999, Prince, Little Red Corvette. That's when the reality hit that we crossed. We was definitely on a wave. I saw his success. The, the time, it was sort of a concept band that Prince and I had worked out, and we sort of worked this concept, brought it to life. You know, it was the clothes, the, the zoot suits, and eventually, uh, because I'm not a dancer and I can't do all the current dances, I make up my own dances, so that just became a thing. It all became a part of the Morris Day Persona. The Morris Day that you see on stage is a little more animated, probably a little crazier, you know. The time was all of Prince's funkiness. Yeah, it was hardcore R&B. They were full-on, in-your-face punk band. Oh, they rocked it every single night. When you go on stage like that, you're you're not only good, but you're pissed. Moonlingus was mad for real. And it was the one way in time where you could get it out and it wasn't destructive. He was up there playing through grit teeth and mean. They were, to be perfectly honest, the only band I was afraid of. And rightfully so. Yeah. <laughs> because every night we tried to kick his ass. <laughs> they were turning into Godzilla. You can't fuck with a 10 minute vamp on cool. Uh, we traveled for nine months together. What you learned and what an experience couldn't buy with all the money in the world. We had a better band than Prince. We could outplay them, you know, except for Prince. So he basically could have had any musicians that he wanted, but he chose the ones that he chose for his own reasons. And um, when it came down to it, yes, our band played better. It was competitive. Sometimes it would get heated, but, you know, that, that's what it was all about. It was competition, you know, and we always tried to outdo one another, and it showed.
And then there was the Vanity Six thing. You had a real sense of drama. We were growing up for maybe two and a half years. It was like a normal life situation. They had already broken up, but he was trying to make people think he was still in there. And they would hang together, but she was making everybody aware that it was just a hang, that she was really done with him. And Susan Williams, he's, she's not sleeping with him either. Jill Jones is there. It was crazy. It was it, it's sort of rough trying to, trying to maintain a relationship among, in, amongst the rock and roll. It was a little awkward, I have to admit. It was tough at times. Brenda was the only one that could sing. I mean, her ego was out of control at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't see how the girls could have t continued anyways with the tension. He would come out and play background for the Vanity's band. He would stand in the back and he would watch. And then when we went up as the time, stand in the back and watch. And then he'd come out and do his show. In the movie, everybody's both groups are acting as if they're their own entity. But in real life, all of the groups are under Prince's control. We were uh, Prince's band. We never were royalty artists individually. Morris was. Uh, it really would be nice if Prince was nicer, but you know, look at what, look at what's going on, you know? So I guess we can afford to let him be an asshole. He's making you more famous every day. You might not have the money to show for it, but at least you're famous. For no, I was never tripping like that because I remember being so broke. No, we were going broke in San Diego. We were all sharing rooms except for Morris. So I never equated his wealth with what I should be making. For Terry, it was serious. It wasn't a grandstanding type thing. We weren't making any money. Dead. I'm broke. I'm in the time. I'm, I got gold, platinum. I'm broke as a mother. Like, I didn't even pay attention. I'm so broke. But I knew that that was his sh The reason why you never hear me bitch and moan about it because it's like you're there by choice. See, I never knew what the revolution made. We never dealt with it. I'm sure they were making more than us. We were well below the top level because we were making our little hundred and fifty dollars a week in a check you get to the point of wow you mean we actually get paid to do that <laughs> oh okay well there's somebody taking care of all this stuff then <laughs> oh you mean somebody tuned it for me oh wow you know now you're you're upset if they didn't tune it the way you like them to or what do you mean you didn't change the string you know what i mean the, the greatest pleasure though was uh just the ability to walk off stage and just be done with it. Just back on the bus or back to the hotel. Then I started to work for this rock star. Prince got to like me. Controversy tour in 1999. All that fame and we'd go places and people would want to touch us. Oh man, but I was so lonesome, lonesome. Prince is so lonesome, you wouldn't believe it. All these rock stars, I know about all of them. Molly Coo, I know about all of them, they're all lonesome. The road life is extremely lonely. Warner Brothers definitely supported the tour. All three records were all Warner Brothers records. You couldn't have a better situation. You know, money's one thing, but so is another. I wouldn't mind if I just went broke, you know, because as long as I could play this type of thing and come here, my thing. It's a good feeling. Went over pretty good. I was driving home from the gig, wiping sweat off my brow, and I heard automatic. And we just got through playing it. And we don't normally play that one, but I mean, there were a lot of people there tonight. And they turned the lights on, and I looked up, and you know, it brings tears to your eyes because it's just you can feel the love in the room, you know. And that means more than money, you know. I, I could just, I could go on for hours. Cause I don't know, I, I, I just have fun and I'm thankful to be alive, you know. I wanted to give them a little taste of where we live and get a little taste of where y'all live. Um, to me, this is like my second home. I just want to tell all my little motor babies that I'm just happy to be here. If I could spend the night in somebody's crib, you know, I would. This is a hotel. They're real nice to us, but this bed is hard. MTV never had urban artists on. All that changed. So Michael Jackson with Beat It, we were on with 1999 Little Red Corvette. The songs had a runway to land on in the public perception that no Prince record before that it had. Anyway, I've got more videos, including a couple from my personal favorite, Prince. I'm a real big Prince fan. We're showing Little Red Corvette, and I demanded that I see that when I came, because I like Prince, 
And I think the man is a bad his shoes a little bit too high. I don't know how he dance around like that with shoes is high, but the man is good. And that's coming up right after this. So don't move from in front of your television set. It's going to get funny in a second. People are coming prepared. They know the songs, they're into it, they're waiting for songs. So it definitely became a real audience. It changes everything about playing live. And he was starting to play with the set list to leak new songs and future songs. Every day at a sound check would be some kind of new thing, a new jam, a new idea. I mean, we were really feeling ourselves. We had attached him in about three or four gigs in a row. He started seeing it. There's just no comparison. This I mean, is what I saw. Prince was starting to cross. The time was still in that, that, that black audience. That's right. So that's what you saw. The audience, you know, they come from the hood. They, the time was like, oh, what? We were going more rock and roll. <laughs> there was a point we were touring the X number of minutes before showtime. Road manager or one of the managers would come in. And, hey, audience is about 75% white. And that number kept going up. So we wanted our audience to look like the Western world. We would play songs like Let's Work because we had to. But he really wanted to do the uh, Little Red Corvettes in the 1990. He, he was changing. 1999, Little Red Corvette, that was the breakthrough. He would use different voices. Paul said it was soul music. He was doing things that were more rock based and not like church. The time is a funk band and you guys aren't. It, you could really see the shift. You would think that would be a great package, like people would love that, but it became a contest. And that's when he took them off the tour. Because the reviews were all, yeah, Prince was great, you gotta see the time. He didn't particularly like that. He would stop us from doing certain dances, from wearing certain clothes. He just never wanted there to be any room to upstage him. And he would always tell us, you know, they're not interested in you, they're here to see us. If you did a dance that he didn't like, he'd come in the dressing rooms every night, practically, and had these big talks with Morris and say, don't you guys go out there and do the bird, and don't you guys do this. And you. So the management's like, you know, we're going to put you on your own tour. There was a good side to it and a very bad side to it. He didn't want that. And they changed their mind. A lot of the major markets, he wouldn't let the time play, so it'd be him and Vanity Six. And we're up backing up Vanity Six. So, you know, we were reduced to just playing for the Vanity Six, which, you know, we didn't really want to do that either, so... Prince would put the burden of vocals on onto Brenda, and so she would have to push Denise along. It got heated a couple of times. There was a serious fight. One of the shows back in their dressing room, probably the most intense yeah. moment that ever happened between the two of them. There was always tension. <laughs> And to add Denise up against the wall. Prince had to come. He goes, can't you control your wife? Yeah, I mean, she was going through her own thing mm -hmm. at that time, too. I mean, yeah. he would just set the whole thing up. And it's very difficult to actually have a relationship and be a part of a, a group. We'd wait to get to these major cities and, and we'd be real happy, and then we wouldn't get to play, and it was a real drag. We'd go into a city like... LA and New York and he'd throw us off the bill because he was afraid of us upstaging him and that was a very, you know, in cities like that is where all the critics come out. And he would just throw the time off the bill completely. And he did that on the East Coast and he did it on the West Coast. So we never played those markets and we'd be pissed. It was utterly ridiculous. We were all creations in this play. The time and Vanity Six, all these people wear what you want and do what you want and play what you want was his ability to control our people. You just don't need a lot for the time to be mad. We ain't paid. We're going back to the hood when the tour is, you know, it wasn't a lot. The bands weren't speaking because the time could kick their ass and often did. He created a monster and then couldn't deal with it. It didn't take long to learn a lot of it had to do with what had happened with Jimmy Jam and Terry before I joined. The one time when Jimmy and Terry didn't make the gig. And Terry and Jimmy had already begun their productions. When I heard the songs, I was like, Dude, you know, guys, these are incredible. We were in New York City. Here, we're here in New York. We're here in New York. Radio City. The world was huge at that time. Every celebrity you could think of was there to see Prince and was wondering where the hell we were. We arrived to the hall and we found out, we find out when we get there that we're not playing, okay? I am hey, I don't blame them because it was like we were all in New York and we never even got to play. And we had two days off in New York after that day. But it was that particular show that when those guys left New York and went to Atlanta, it was that after that particular really depressing ordeal. And, he's, I don't, and, and that's mm -hmm. when those guys went to Atlanta. I guess they were told not to go record other songs for other people, and they did that. Anyway, we had a show. We had never missed a gig. They got snowed in somewhere. This particular show we had in Atlanta, I think. 
<laughs> we've gone to Atlanta to do SOS band. Or were they in Atlanta? It's bound to be one of Atlanta's most memorable winter snowstorm. In the morning, the, the whole snowstorm happened. We thought of every possible scenario. Hooked ourselves on 10 different flights. And they <laughs> all canceled. It was the worst day of my life. We're in the Atlanta airport. We were up and down for eight hours. And what's taking off? Anybody taking off? Any we missed the gig in San Antonio. It hadn't snowed during 50 years. Literally 50 years. The next day, we were in San Antonio. They missed the show. We played the show in San Antonio. And the night that Terry and Jimmy missed, Prince played. Prince was off to the side playing bass. And, and Lisa played keyboards. They, they strapped me up with a bass. I don't play the bass. And put me in front of the mic. They rolled them to the end of the tour and fired them. And that was pretty much the beginning of the end. When, I mean, she was beautiful. But, uh, you know, she... She had her ego. And mm -hmm. what happened with a lot of people that passed through that camp is mm -hmm. that they would lose themselves quite easily because he would mm -hmm. build them up into a, where they started to believe these things that he would tell them mm -hmm. and get lost. And then suddenly they feel that they have all the power. They're more important than everybody else. Has success affected you in any way? Um, affected me. Has it affected me? Not, that's what my friends don't say it has, really. I'm still the jerk I always was. <laughs> you know, Jimmy and Terry went off to do their own thing, and of course they missed the show, and that was the, yeah. the beginning of the end. Yeah. It wasn't surprising to me when these things would happen, uh, just because of how they've developed, mm -hmm. how things were in the machine, how the machine formulated things, yeah. Yeah. that it was bound to happen at some point. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and particularly... When people have certain talents, Jimmy and Terry, you know, that they, they deserve to do their own thing. Yeah. And it was, you know, I'm sure they would have only lasted so long because they didn't want, as much as they respected Prince, they didn't want to be under his thumb. The band was an uneasy situation. You know, it, it wasn't settled. And that was still yet to change when Des left. He was testing the name on the back of the album. He, he did it, that illustration himself, and he put that backwards in there. In, in regard to my involvement in the band, it came to a head on that 1999 tour. It's like it is with your biological brothers. You know, you may love each other, but there comes a point, you know, where you're teenagers, where, you know, you, you start <laughs> you start throwing hands and, and, you know, trying to knock one another out. Uh, the time situation, I sort of had a chip on my shoulder. I had to prove to myself and the world that Morris Day could do it alone, right? Produce a range and, you know, perform all that stuff. So that was in my system and I had to get rid of it. Well, it wasn't so much that I broke up with them. I broke off with Vanity Six, you know, the two girls. I wanted to record the album Wild Animal and I wanted, wanted to record it solo. Therefore, I had to leave the group in order to do that. I, I was in love with them, so... Did you ever think you'd get uh, back together with them again? Hiding or seeking? Your relationship with Prince, is that still all right? People ask me that question constantly. Well, well the relationship, we don't talk, so um, we're not upset about each other. Or it's not ugly, but we don't really see each other or talk about anything. It just kept getting better and better. We just... Yeah.